You ever see something you couldn't explain? Something unreal, unhinged, like a nightmare? You are not alone. They opened the doors for him through an entrance. They stormed the building. And I looked across the cage at Calvin and I could see him. And I swear he looked like S.A. Diablo. I'm here with the winner, Derek Lewis. Derek, why'd you take your pants off? My balls was hot. Got down to the, uh, to the uh, loading docks where the fighters were getting on the buses and started to attack. Bang, man! What are you doing that, man? The I, I do. I, I killed Bruce Lee. I broke his neck. <laughs> what are these? Who, who makes these what? questions up? I do. Let me bang. I do. Man. Let you bang. Hey. Let me bang you too, man. Ah, just try and stop me, Brussels. Ah. Let me bang. I'll let you bang. Little. I show my nuts right now. I swear to God. Every day. You got baby nuts, Dada. I can't believe. I want to fuck. I want to fight. This makes me cringe. It's embarrassing. On tonight's episode of Midnight Paintings, MMA Mysteries and Anomalies, we're looking at some of MMA's most curious cases. How the world-class fighter gets beaten by a brawler. He's out! Sensational knockout by Bigfoot Silva! How the world champion grappler gets submitted by a purple belt. Look at this! Oh, we catch him! How an aging boxer chaos one of MMA's biggest champions. And much, much more. Turn off the lights, grab your favorite human, and prepare to experience the depths of the human psyche. Okay, let's drop the theatrics going forward. That intro was way too much work. Anything can happen in MMA, and a dodge as old as the Bible. With the first recorded usage of the phrase being uttered by St. Paul himself, along with other timeless bops. Note, that is not factually inaccurate. Alistair Overeem entered the world of elite kickboxing in 2008, going on a prolific run in the sport that lasted about two years. A small era that saw him besting exceptional competition in the likes of Badr Hari, Gokun Saki, and Peter Arts, to name a few. His rise to the world of kickboxing ultimately resulted in the capturing of the prestigious Kickboxing K1 Grand Prix World Championship title in 2010. Overeem had entered the world of pure striking after suffering a string of defeats in MMA. His rebound to a new sport saw him emerge as an even better, faster, and stronger fighter. His revitalization was most apparent on his return to MMA, where he embarked on a 10-fight win streak, capturing the inaugural heavyweight championship titles for both Strikeforce and Dream Promotions along the way. Overeem's new and improved dominance culminated in his much-typed and talked-about UFC debut against Brock Lesnar in 2011, which just about exceeded all expectations for Overeem fans. Dubbed Uberim by fans of media at the time, who noted the fighter's improved craft, prowess in the ring and cage, and, and what was most apparent, a new hulking physique. He was, by all accounts, hot shit. Whoa! I know, he was great, huh? Hey, you fantastic body! Oh, uh, so when Overeem was tapped to face Antonio Bigfoot Silva in 2013, fans, and indeed Overeem himself, weren't all too worried. I know I'm a better fighter. The fight will probably end in one or two rounds. I'm gonna raise my hands after, and he's just gonna be a, a number on my list. While Antonio Silva was a six foot four, 265 pound man who had an uncanny ability to bully other heavyweights around, touting a resume of weighty knockouts to boot, including one against the legendary fighter Fedor Emelianenko, Silva unfortunately had a penchant for coming up short in several high level bouts. So, Antonio Silva's reputation amongst fans and commentators leading into the fight was not exactly spectacular. 
As the story went, if Overeem was known for his presence, prestige, and championships, Silva was not. So it came as a shock when this happened. So, why did it happen? Well, Silva had done his homework. One of Overeem's significant tactics during his era was his clinch work. Utilizing a mixture of outside strikes, footwork, and sometimes on just sheer prowess, Overeem often found his way into the pocket, where he would establish strong ties on his opponents. And once he got there, well... And against Silva, for as long as the fight lasted, Overeem indeed found some success with his signature tactic. But not always, as Silva managed to stalemate the hulking Dutchman more than a couple times throughout the fight. However, and more importantly, as the fight progressed, Silva had noted that while Overeem was very good at finding entries into the clinch and was very good at dodging the strikes meant to keep him away, he was not good at doing both at the same time. So as Silva began pressuring forward behind strikes, which initiated Overeem's head movement, he quickly shortened the gap between them and began unloading uppercuts and hooks. And as Overeem attempted to quickly close the gap himself with ties and clinch work, he found himself absorbing free strikes from a preemptive Silva, who saw the strategy coming from a mile away. While it's easy to say that Overeem just wildly underestimated his opponent, and I will because it seems that's exactly what happened, you also have to give credit to Silva, who, in actuality, had a pretty good dirty boxing game to begin with, and he capitalized on those strengths to overcome the seemingly unbeatable monster that was Ubering. And this sort of thing isn't the first time it's happened. If we look back at a more major recent upset like that of Luke Rockhold versus Michael Bisping 2, similar aspects played out. Hold on a minute, what are you doing there? Ah, much better. Now, this fight had little to do with the finer points of clinching, but everything to do with entirely underestimating your opponent. Michael Bisping had been tapped as a last minute replacement for Luke Rockhold, after Rockhold's original opponent, Chris Weidman, had dropped out of the rematch due to injury. Their highly anticipated rematch was expected to be as vociferous and exciting as their first. Alas, it was just not meant to be. So, on only 17 days notice, and fresh off a movie set, Michael Bisping accepted the challenge, and an opportunity for the UFC's middleweight championship title. Luke Rockhold made his career out of a stellar ground game, climbing the ranks of different promotions right into title contention. After beating insanely accomplished grappler and then-champion Ronaldo Souza in 2011, he became Triforce's middleweight champion, defending the title twice before transitioning into the UFC, and, after a rocky debut, set on the course for the promotion's title finally squaring off against then-UFC middleweight champion Chris Weidman in 2015. Need great challenges. Absolutely. And some of the guys in the past, boy, they... So, with Weidman out of the way, Hello, darkness, Michael Bisping was set to be Rockhold's first official title defense. And, in a case of history repeating itself, fans and media paid very little attention to the potentials of a smack-talking Englishman. Though, this time the overt downplaying was a bit more concrete as Rockhold and Bisping had already faced off before. And, in that fight, Rockhold came out the clear victor. In the MMA world, Michael Bisping had earned a reputation as being a career fighter, a journeyman. It makes martial artists good enough to best good fighters, but not quite great enough to truly break out amongst the elite. He had, up to that point, compiled a fairly substantial record of 35 total bouts over the course of a 14-year professional career, and while Bisping certainly had some good wins to his name, he also experienced some really, really bad losses. And before we go on, the press and media events leading up to Rockhold vs. Bisping 2 has created some of the best and most hilarious moments in the history of the sport. It is my destiny. You can't write this. It's your destiny to be my little... Luke had been known for his jock-like demeanor and cocksure attitude. Light heavyweight's kind of a, it's a scarce division of, of names and of real talent. You know, people with substance. Do you rather just swallow or spit, girl? What? While Michael was known for being an incredible smack talker, easily and often getting under his opponent's skin. You wanna go right now? I'm always ready. You are a f***ing pussy. <laughs> Henderson, listen, Henderson's gonna die soon. Yeah, so yeah. I might as well <laughs> knock him out. So the chemistry between the two, or rather lack of chemistry, made for literal timeless moments. I know something's gonna happen if you're confident in that situation. You will achieve things in life. Things. That's how you put yourself out there. You believe it and you achieve it. Sounds like I the know worst that self-help book out. you've ever read. Conceive, believe, achieve. Shut the f*** up. <laughs> Listen. It's great. What are you talking about? Oh, that's right, the fight. Uh... <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, it was a shock to everybody, including me. In order to understand the bigger picture here, let's talk more about Luke Rockhold for a second. As we touched on before, Rockhold had achieved championship success on the back of his primary asset, his grappling. However, he had also developed a fair striking game through the evolution of his career, having even won a few bouts via technical knockout. But this aspect in his development wasn't without its flaws. The biggest of which was that, despite Rockhold's cocky demeanor and flashy strikes, he was just not a very defensively sound striker, especially off of his hands, where he often stood too proud and often left his chin hanging way up in the air after exchanges. And, well, I'll say this. What Bisping did to Rockle was unfortunately the start of a very great trend for the former champion. So much time being spent. Oh! Underestimating your opponent has resulted in an endless list of major upsets over the years. Dominic Cruz vs. Cody Garbrandt, Holly Holm vs. Ronda Rousey, and even Nate Diaz vs. Conor McGregor won. All these major upsets underpin major underdog stories, where combatants don't take their seemingly lesser opponents seriously and end up paying the price for it. Styles make fights. A common phrase used in the combat sports world to describe the tenable yet amorphous nature of high level fighting. While the elite combatants of MMA have finally attuned their overall skill sets to address an expansive area of challenges, no one fighter, by the inherent broad nature of the sport, is indeed perfect. Gaps in certain areas and skills are abound in a combat sport that requires a vast and nuanced understanding of a wide array of practical martial arts and combat styles. Though, as the overall skill ceiling rises through the evolution and maturation of the sport, as new generation of fighters take with them the teachings and experience of their predecessors, implementing improvements of their own, that inherent skill gap becomes smaller and smaller every new permutation. In the modern landscape, the average mixed martial artist has leapfrogged their ancestors in the overall understanding of the craft, no longer just being good in a few areas and passable in others, but being great and good in a lot of them. Fighters like John Jones, Israel Adesanya, Charles Oliveira, and Zabit Magomed Sharipov, for example, have adapted their excellent bases into a seemingly all-encompassing style capable of successfully addressing threats from all manners of areas, from the feet to the ground. However, other fighters have instead sought to rely on a more narrow set of tools for their overall game plans. We call these fighters specialists. The grappler, the Thai boxer, the wrestler. Purists who, instead of adapting their styles to meet a more broader proficient skill set, hone in on the specific traits that they're really, really good at. In other words, fighters that seek to capitalize on that inherent skill gap. However, as I touched on before, as new breeds of fighters become more accustomed and adaptive to threats from all manners of areas, the specialist is, unfortunately for them, on the way out. Enter Rodolfo Vieira versus Anthony Hernandez. Whoa! Oh, not again. Rodolfo Vieira is a very, very well accomplished grappler. In fact, to just say Vieira is an accomplished grappler feels like an understatement. A black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Vieira holds well over a dozen championships from various prestige international submission and grappling tournaments, most notably 5IB WGF World Titles and a 2015 gold medal from the ADCC World Championships, the premier submission grappling tournament. Vieira entered professional MMA in 2017, going 5-0 before his arrival in the UFC. Vieira's nascent career showed his potentials as a serious prospect, further cementing that status after winning both his debut and follow-up fight, graduating his record to 7 wins and 0 losses. And, well, you might have already guessed it, all but one of his 7 wins came via submission, namely chokes. Strong guy like Vieira, oh, this is his move. move. This it's is how he won his debut, that's it's it, it's happening. 
Vieira's next challenge came in the form of fellow prospect and grappler Anthony Hernandez. Hernandez, like Vieira, was a prospect working his way to the rankings. What's interesting is that, like Vieira, a majority of Hernandez's wins came via submission. What's even more interesting above that is that they were also primarily from chokes. However, unlike Vieira, Hernandez did not have much in the way of hype following him, owing to his uh, not so impeccable record. So it would seem to the observer and Vieira himself that Anthony Hernandez was a sure victory. Vieira was to face off against a relatively neophyte grappler whose biggest strengths were primarily playing to the best parts of his game. And after finishing him, he'd have enough time to go home, feed the kids, water his plants, or do whatever it is that grapplers do on their free time. I mastered Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Crawl atop me and meet your doom. And well, just roll the damn clip. You know how this goes already. Look at this! Oh, he got him! Oh my God, he's getting got it! So, what happened here? Well, let's unpack the biggest issues first. Underestimation and relative inexperience were by far the biggest culprits that play for Vieira here. While Hernandez was no ADCC world champion, he indeed had answers to Vieira's submission threats. And as a response to these unforeseen challenges, Vieira switched to a somewhat more brute force approach, shooting for forceful takedowns that only accomplished the acceleration of the inevitable, as Vieira succumbed further and further to exhaustion. However, and most importantly, at the heart of all Vieira's failings was the lack of a better overall skill set. Without much presence on the feet, and as whatever wrestling and takedown acumen is used only in service of imposing a raw grappling game plan, Vieira didn't pose much of a threat to his relatively more overall skillful opponent. And I hear ya. I'm probably being too harsh on Vieira, considering his MMA career is still relatively new, and he did just win his most recent fight. What I'm saying is that, without much needed improvement, Vieira may find himself struggling in higher level matchups. Ryan Hall is another example. Hall is a specialist who is very, very good at grappling, but very, very bad at everything else. Okay, so he has some offensive striking that is fine, especially against journeymen. But it's clear with its relaxed execution, paired with a bottom lack of physical defense, and coupled with the fact that Hall just instinctively wants to grapple at any given chance, no matter how crude the effort is to meet those ends, it was only a matter of time before someone capitalized on those fatal flaws. And in case you think I'm being one-sided, this isn't exclusive to grapplers. Steven Thompson is a high-level striker, who has in fact managed to climb the title contention, and has up until recently at least, been a stable of UFC's high-level competition. Yet, throughout his career, Thompson has exhibited holes in his primarily strike-centric game that much better fighters, namely more well-rounded wrestlers and grapplers, have managed to exploit, often serving as the wedge between championship status and mere contendership throughout Thompson's career. And... Rafael Fazayev is yet another highly touted specialist. Fazayev is currently working his way through the lightweight rankings with considerable hype. An accomplished Thai boxer, Fazayev has so far conquered everyone put in front of him. So forget that the hell out of here. I'm likely in a very small group of people with what I'm about to say about Fazayev. So feel free to call me out in the comments. Oh boy. But I think his last two fights are indicative that Fazayev is not as untouchable as he's being made out to be. Specialists have enjoyed massive success once upon a time. He's got so much power in those fists, Mike. Up against the fence. fence. Big trouble. Let's see. Try to finish it. That's it. Pumpkin is there. And it is all over. He's out. But in the world of modern MMA, where the advancement of total skills in the sport grow more and more every year, they just don't cut it like they used to. It's been a talk of the town for a while now that MMA athletes just aren't very good. Makowski, the younger fighter, senses it, and he walks away from Nick Sarah. Sarah, a desperation attempt. You said, how does he get to the ground? He jumped guard from about five feet away. Well, at least according to the people who really, really like boxing and really, really don't like mixed martial arts. Wow, wow, wow. This is Look at him just pressing on the head here, though. That for still oh, that's illegal. His knee was down. His knee was all the way down. 
And looking at Ray Mercer versus Tim Sylvia, it would seem they have a point. Ready, aim, fire. Good night. End of story. <laughs> and Mercer Whoa. looks like he shot. Some quick backstory. Ray Mercer, boxing gold medalist of the 1988 Olympic Games, was most prolific as a pugilist during the late 80s and mid 90s. His heyday saw him facing off against iconic heavyweights like Tommy Morrison, Evander Holyfield, and Larry Holmes, to name a few. Known for his knockout power, Ray Mercer made his way through his Olympic and professional boxing career by toppling much of his opposition. The man he would face decades later, Tim Sylvia, was the UFC heavyweight champion during the early turn of the century, where he competed amongst other now legendary fighters like Jeff Momsen, Rico Rodriguez, and Andre Arlovsky. Sylvia captured the heavyweight titles in two separate runs, amassing a total of three defenses. Standing at a towering 6'8", and easily being one of the sport's heaviest, Tim Sylvia was a force to be reckoned with. At the time of their matchup, to many a casual observer, Sylvia was a zenith of MMA, the athlete representative of the sport's highest caliber and concentration of skill. So when Mercer, aging boxer, fell the giant, it all but validated the feelings amongst critics that MMA and its fighters weren't all they were cracked up to be. And as we all know, after their matchup in 2009, MMA ceased to exist. And they were right. Just look at this. It's a circus. Who would ever take this seriously? What do I, What are you doing? Oh, yeah, just up. Oh, okay. That's very cool. Well, that's not actually MMA, but that's fine. Right away, you can see Cindy Dandois very stiff in her strike. She 50 45 the atmosphere. If that doesn't convince you that MMA is a huge joke, here's UFC superstar and anti centenarian Conor McGregor celebrating after a win. Absolutely disgusting. So now that MMA is no more, I'm taking the initiative and rebranding from here on out, finally pursuing my dreams to their fullest, pivoting full time into deep analysis of the social, political, and psychoanalytical storytelling of 90s Nickelodeon. And no, you fools, there's not a damn thing you can do to stop me. Dreams do come true. Cousin Skeeter tells the stories and life lessons of Bobby. A boy growing up in a healthy nuclear family at the turn of the century. His eclectic and outgoing cousin Skeeter, along with his friend Nina, guide Bobby through the confusing and at times harrowing stages of early teenage dumb. Critics have favorably compared the show's themes and moral bedrock to the tenets of 18th century political philosopher Edmund Burke, grandfather of conservatism himself. You see, at the heart of Cousin Skeeter is a story about the immutable and natural traits given to us from birth, while the titular character, Skeeter, is an abomination whose mere existence is an act against God and Mother Nature herself. His place in the social strata gives way to a unique perspective, the experiences of which he utilizes to provide an equally unique and enriching counsel to his cousin Bobby, proving once again that every being, no matter their place in the social hierarchy, plays an important role in society, be they rich or poor, human or puppet. Yeah! Hold on. Perhaps I missed something with this MMA stuff. Let's uh, back up for a second. So, let's start off our analysis, no, not that one, by rejecting the false premise shared by detractors and even Ray Mercer himself that mixed martial arts and boxing are mutually exclusive concepts. They are not. They are inextricable. Boxing is just as much an aspect of MMA as any other striking martial art. While the purest form of pugilism does not exist in mixed martial arts, its tenets still inform major components of the MMA striking meta.
With that out of the way, and getting to the meat of our analysis, what does the outcome of Ray Mercer versus Tim Sylvia specifically say about each fighter's skill, sport, or superiority? Well, not really anything. One major reason for this is that it's quite hard to quantify overall skill when matches end as fast and abruptly as Mercer vs. Sylvia did. Fans and critics are quick to either paint the event as proof of boxing superiority, or merely as a result of a lucky punch. So which is it? Well, lucky for us, the historical context leading up to the fight gives us a better insight into why Mercer vs. Sylvia happened the way it did, so we don't have to guess. And spoilers, Mercer most likely just got lucky. Tim Sylvia debuted in the UFC as a much touted prospect, entering the promotion undefeated, with a record of 13 wins and 0 losses. In just his second fight in the promotion, Sylvia dethroned then champ Rico Rodriguez at UFC 41, becoming the UFC's new heavyweight champion. While he would soon go on to lose the title to Frank Mir after a single successful defense, Sylvia would regroup, successfully working his way back into title contention with consecutive wins, recapturing the heavyweight title of UFC 59 after defeating Andrei Arlovsky. His second reign proved the best of both records, as he would tally two successful defenses before unfortunately losing the title once again. And this is when the downturn in Sylvia's career became really apparent. As a matter of fact, the man who beat Sylvia this time around for his title, Randy Couture, is illustrative of Sylvia's new struggles, as Couture was also bestowed the somewhat dubious record of oldest heavyweight champion in the promotion's history. Following a second championship loss, Sylvia struggled to rebound into title contention. While Sylvia's fights following his second title loss were competitive, he never really picked up the same momentum as before. At the weigh-ins of Mercer vs. Sylvia, Tim himself showed up overweight, just hovering at a lumbering 310 pounds, looking like he hadn't trained seriously or hadn't hit a heavy bag in months. So did Mercer get lucky? Well, I'll let you decide on that. Ray Mercer would later tell sports journalists, following his win over Sylvia, that MMA fighters were actually afraid of fighting him. And, well, in actuality, this wasn't even Mercer's first MMA fight, nor was it even his first foray into a different world of combat sport. Ray Mercer previously fought in kickboxing, where, uh, he got his ass kicked. And that first MMA fight I mentioned, he lost that one too. Uh, to who, you might be asking? Kimbo. Kimbo Slice. This Kimbo Slice. Lastly, to say Tim Sylvia represented the highest level MMA in his period is a bit odd. He certainly was one of the higher level combatants, but the best of the sports? I don't think so. It's been sort of a meme for a while now that the UFC's heavyweight division has been mostly barren, largely depleted of elite level talent. And that's not to say that Tim Sylvia's era wasn't good, or that the heavyweights at the time weren't good. They were okay. But in an era where the likes of Anderson Silva and George St. Pierre had established dominant reigns in incredibly competitive middleweight and welterweight divisions, it's a bit of a leap to say that Tim Sylvia, at the time of his matchup against Ray Mercer, was the best of what the sport had to offer. And if you wanted to see another outcome of the boxer versus MMA debate, see James Tomey versus Old Man Couture. He's got to defend by putting it against his ear. He's going out. And it's all oh, over. As a fan of combat sports, these matchups are ultimately very interesting, even as discussions of these events tend to get very heated. It's mostly just a testament to how much people really care. And that's definitely worth something.
Hello. I, uh, I hope you really enjoyed these, uh, kind of silly series of videos I've made. Uh, they took a lot more time than I thought they would, and, uh, I originally created these videos because, uh, I wanted to cre create something a little bit more funny and lighthearted. Um, and I, I, what I thought would be less involved, but it turned out to be actually quite intensive and, and time-consuming. Um, so I really hope you enjoyed the effort, and, uh, please like and subscribe and, and share my video if you liked it. Thank you so much. Have a great day.